got to fix this thing. It was, I was sitting in the chair back there and the clip fell off and it hit the floor. So hopefully it survives. This morning we are going to get a bit of a history lesson. I love history. I love history. Uh, in fact, I changed my mind about three different times before I finally landed on this uh, area of study in life. I was going to be a history major, and then, of course, I went into emergency medicine and stuff like that, but I love history. Um, you know what they say about history? Those who don't know it, what? They're doomed to repeat it, right? <laughs> if you can't remember the past, then you are condemned to repeat the past, you know? People that don't remember the past, they were, did you know that they were actually shocked whenever they voted in our current president and the economy took a nosedive? You know, they were actually shocked. I mean, goodness gracious. The first thing that he did was try to put an end to domestic oil production by shutting down what? The pipeline and the new oil leases, right? You know, there was a brief window, a very brief window. This is oil production. In the United States, you see 2011, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, then something happened, right? In 2017, look at those oil production prices. That was exports. At one point in time, just a couple years ago, we were exporting more oil than we are importing, right? They were selling oil for what, like, I don't know, was it $40, $50 a barrel, something like that? That means they had so much left over they could afford to do that but we couldn't handle any more mean tweets could we (laughs) so trump had to go again those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it (sighs) i guess it's okay to pay four dollars a gallon for gas you know i'm thankful i have four dollars to pay uh, but our current president's just fixed us up right Those who are ignorant of the past (laughs) are doomed to repeat it. And that's what Paul is going to talk about this morning, is those being ignorant of the past. you got, you got to learn from the past. you got to, you got to remember what has gone on. And so we're going to start in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and we're going to start in verse 1. If you have, turn your Bibles uh, to 1 Corinthians 10. It says, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud... And that they all passed through the sea. So that's talking about after what happened in Egypt. There was the cloud that they followed and they went through the Red Sea. It says they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. And that rock was Christ. A lot of people have a hard time studying the Old Testament. They say, well, Jesus wasn't around in the Old Testament. Well, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4, he was there. It says that rock was Christ. So last week we talked about uh, this race, this, this, this marathon, if you will, of the Christian life and how Paul talked about the possibility of being disqualified from this race. And now he's urging the Corinthian people. He's saying, you know what? you got to serve the Lord. This is important. Get your act together. Get your mind right. And so what he does here is he points to the negative example of the Israelites. Whenever they were in the wilderness, he was, he was talking about their experiences. You know, he, he repeatedly, he uses the word all. He keeps saying the word all to emphasize the fact that every one of them experienced the supernatural benefits of the deliverance, the guidance, and the provision of the Lord God. He guided them to glory by his cloud. He delivered them through the Red Sea. They were baptized into their spiritual leader, Moses. They all ate the same spiritual food, which was the manna that came down from heaven. They drank from the spiritual rock. The spiritual rock that followed them, that was Christ. So he uses the word all. After all the Israelites were delivered from captivity, it seemed like they had a hard time trusting in the Lord. I mean, they all had seen what? They'd seen the plagues. They all had seen what took place in Egypt. They all had seen his power. They all walked through the Red Sea on dry ground. They all ate manna from heaven, and he even gave them all a GPS tracker in the sky. Follow this cloud by day 
and this fire by night. And yet, one day they got thirsty. They got thirsty one day in Exodus chapter 17, and it talks about how they were grumbling. It talks about how they were complaining. And, and God had Moses strike this rock with his staff, and water came out of the rock. So they would just quit their complaining. This is our first one this morning. Do not let momentary troubles distract you from all that the Lord has blessed you. It took me a minute to phrase this one because I kept putting blessed you with, and you can't end the sentence with a preposition, so it took me a minute to... <laughs> it's easy to see the debt and forget about the job that the Lord has blessed you with, right? It's easy to, to, to look at the diagnosis and forget about the abundance of life that he's blessed you with. I mean, it's easy to worry about the heat, <laughs> But guess what? We didn't have to get up and shovel the snow this morning, right? It's easy to, to, to see all the problems at home, but we forget what a great family he's blessed us with. It's easy to see the world and all the problems in it and what's going on and to forget that he's given us his church. Do not let momentary troubles distract you from all that which the Lord has blessed you. Then, in verse 5, he says, Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. So again, in, all, in, in spite of all that God had blessed them with, he wasn't pleased with most of them. In fact, he made it to where a whole generation was going to be scattered in that wilderness. Remember, the only ones that made it were Joshua and Caleb. Moses didn't even make it. He, he just got to peer over into the promised land. He disciplined them severely. Uh, it was because of their, their perpetual disobedience. It was because of their ungratefulness. God struck them down in the wilderness. So what that tells me is that being a recipient of God's kindness is no guarantee of avoiding his dis discipline <laughs> for our rebellion. So he goes on to say in verse 6, I'm going to have to read that one over here. Now, these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality, as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ, as some of them did, and they were killed by snakes. And do not grumble, as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So the worldliness, okay? The worldliness that was taking place in the Corinthian church was putting them in danger. I would say that in 2022, in the United States of America, the worldliness that is going on in our church is probably not necessarily this church, but the church as a whole in the United States could put us in danger. Paul's saying, <laughs> you saw what happened to them. You saw what happened to the Israelites in the wilderness. We don't want to be like that Corinthian church. You don't want to be in danger of divine uh, chastisement. Look at what they did. They were evil. The things that they did were evil. He said they were idolaters. You need to avoid that. Sexual morality, you need to avoid that. Going around complaining about everything, avoid that. This led to the downfall of the Israelites. Don't let it be your downfall. What he's telling them is that the reason this was written down is so that, so that it would be an example. It was written for our instruction. And he didn't want the lessons of, of the old, the lessons of the Israelites, he did not want them to be lost on the Corinthians. He didn't want them to be lost on us. He said that what happened in Israel is included on the pages of Scripture as a warning for their benefit and a warning for our benefit. And when he talks about those who are the, the culmination of the ages, he's talking about us. He's talking about the Christians. The Christians are those on whom the culmination of the ages has come. And if that's the case, the consequences 
are high for any believers in the church who choose to follow this sinful example of Israel's wilderness generation rather than what Christ taught us to do. Remember uh, his, his warning to, the, to folks that in Galatians. It says, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. I love this passage. God has, God has established certain laws that govern the universe, right? Uh, he's established certain laws that govern the universe in which he has made. Uh, this is true in the physical world as well as the spiritual world. In the physical world, we have the law of gravity, right? This is the law of gravity. I have this Bible. I pick it up and I let it go. What's going to happen? It's going to fall, right? That's a law of gravity. You can't beat that law, I guess, unless you leave the atmosphere. <laughs> you can't beat that law. It's always going to happen. It's the reason you weigh what you do. That's the reason that even if you're six foot tall, maybe when you get a little older, gravity is going to pull you down a little bit. It's a law. You can't get around it. But that's also true of the spiritual world. And right here, Paul is articulating an important spiritual law. It's a spiritual principle when he says that a man reaps what he sows. A farmer, for example, we have plenty of those around here. They're going to harvest exactly what they plant. Wyatt planted soybeans right there. Okay? That doesn't mean that in a, in a few months after planting those soybeans, he's going to go back there and expect to pick potatoes and work. His combine, all that set up to go back there and pick those soybeans. Decide what you want to harvest spiritually and let that control what you decide to sow. This law is universal. It applies to all people everywhere, and you cannot violate this law. It's true, and it's proven without fail. And therefore, Paul says, God cannot be mocked. God cannot be mocked. We cannot dupe ourselves into thinking, and this is our second one this morning, that we can embrace sin without effect. We cannot embrace sin without effect. Do not kid yourself into believing that you can rebel against God without consequences. Yes, the cross forgives all. There is no sin that cannot be forgiven. The cross forgives all. What he did on the cross forgives all. But <laughs> that doesn't mean that there will be without consequence. You think, well, it's just this one time, right? Until this one time turns into the next time. And that time turns into the next time. And that time turns into the next time. You know, no alcoholic ever woke up one day and said, you know what, I think I want to be an alcoholic. Didn't work like that. This time turned into this time, turned into this time, and all of a sudden that downward spiral gets to a point to where, how did I end up like this? That's a consequence. Think about it like this. It's kind of hard to picture sometimes. You think, you know what? A little white lie, that's just a little white lie. What's the consequence of that? What if, what if the more that we did a particular thing, whatever it is, there was compounding interest <laughs> on that little thing, and the more severe our punishment would become? So you tell a lie, and that gets marked down in the ledger. Then you tell another one, and another one, and another one, and the punishment just starts building and building and building. If that were the case, you know what I say? Thank God for the cross. You know, I said today I wasn't going to sin. I woke up, decided I'm not going to sin. I messed it up in the first five minutes. Thank God for the cross. Let's finish this up. And these, these last two verses that we're going to talk about this morning are kind of touchy with some people because I think that we can, we can sometimes wield this kind of like a gun and it, and it really doesn't make sense the way some people try and use these two verses. It says, So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. Here it is. 
He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you're tempted, he'll also provide a way out so that you can endure it. So again, he's kind of reiterating his point here. He does not want the Corinthians to, to, to fail like Israel did in the past. He doesn't want them to fall out of God's favor like Israel had done. And so they need to be careful. You know, temptations to sin, uh, trials that God uses to develop us, that it comes to all Christians alike. No matter what temptation confronts you, what does he say here? You're not alone. No temptation that has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. You're not alone. None of us can claim to experience a temptation worse than anyone else. Now, we have different scenarios. <laughs> we have different trials. We're going to talk about trials in a minute. But just as, as, as Israel's path from Egypt to the promised land took them to the wilderness... The same is true for all of God's people. And this is our last one this morning. To get where God wants you to be, he will test and develop you through those wilderness experiences. Think of it like this. If they had went straight from Egypt into Jericho, they wouldn't have been ready. In fact, they weren't ready. Remember? Oh, we're but like grasshoppers to them. We didn't even come up to their knees. They weren't ready. To get where God wants you to be, sometimes he's going to take you through the wilderness. And everybody's trials look different. Everybody's wilderness is different. But he says there in verse uh, 13, he says, take heart. He says, take heart because God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. No temptation or trial will prove overpowering because Christians are no longer slaves to sin. We have the freedom to choose to do what is good, and God will always provide a way out. I see that, that's, that's where we, we get hung up because <laughs> we forget that last part of the verse that God will always provide a way out. He will grant you the strength so that you can say no to the temptation. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, he will give you the ability to withstand the temptation. He will give you the ability to pass the test. Such a powerful verse. And again, I say it's often mishandled because we draw it like a gun. What have you always heard? God's not going to give you more than you can handle, right? Is that what it said? Let's go back. <laughs> he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But what do we always hear? God's not going to give you more than you can handle. That's not what it says. It doesn't say God's not going to give you more than you can handle. We need to quit telling people that. God's not going to give you more than he can handle. That's what we need to tell them. He's not going to give you more than he can handle. That's how we face trials and temptations. God led them out of Egypt, folks. God led them out of Egypt. God provided them with manna from heaven. God gave them water from that rock. Even though they didn't deserve the water from that rock, God gave them the water from the rock. God will see you through this financial crisis. God will walk you through this diagnosis. God will be right there with you, weeping over the loss of a loved one. You get the point? Today's history lesson is this. God has got this. No matter what it is. It's not that he's not going to give you more than you can bear. He's not going to give you more than he can bear. So what are you worried about? <laughs> now, there's a lot to be worried about. <laughs> Tony Evans said that, that worry is like a rocking chair. It's a vehicle that's constantly in motion. It's never going to take you anywhere. <laughs> He's going to keep going back and forth, back and forth. It's not going to take you anywhere. What are we worried about? God's got this. Gas, $4 a gallon. Oh, God's got it. I got $4 to put in there. One day I might not, but today I got $4 to put in. The economy's doing this. Well, the economy's going to do what it's always done. It's going to go up. It's going to go down. The stocks are going to go up. The stocks are going to go down. Maybe we'll have something of of a social security when I get that age I don't know but guess what God's got it 
You guys remember Joey that used to preach down at, uh, at Eva? He and I were having a conversation one day, and uh, we were talking about how sometimes we just stay up at night because we pray for so many people, and all, we, we hear all these different people's problems, and it just worries us so much. He said, yeah, my dad used to be like that. And he said, I asked him, I said, well, how do you get over that? How, how? He said, because I've lost sleep at night. He said, yeah, I used to sleep, lose sleep at night. But there's a lot of bad stuff going on in the world. But you know what I did? I started praying. I said, God, you got it. And he said, I got the best sleep I ever got <laughs> after turning it over to God. Yeah, there's a lot of tough stuff. Don't know what the president's going to do. Don't know what's going to happen over in the Ukraine. I was watching a video on YouTube yesterday of this guy. Uh, I like to watch a lot of the blacksmith videos. He was making a knife over in the Ukraine, and you could hear the sirens going off in the background. Don't know what's going to happen, but God's got it. I mean, he's sending people in there with food right now for those people. He's sitting there, sending people in there to get folks out right now. God's got it. No matter what it is, God's got it. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this time that we get to come here and worship you. Thank you uh, for your word that we can look back at what happened in Israel, that we can look back at what happened in Corinth, and that, 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 that we can have trust and we can put our faith in you that uh, no matter what happens in this world, with our jobs, with our family, with our friends, with, with whatever, that, that you are in control and that there is nothing that you cannot handle. We thank you uh, for the security in that, and we put our faith in you, God. It's in, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.